Okay, so I'm a bit late to this discussion, but hear me out. Hey. How you doing? So for those who've been here for a while, y'all may remember how Subnautica kind of became one of my all-time favorite games entirely by surprise. It honestly feels like forever ago since I finished my original series on it, and I still look back on memories of that first playthrough with a big ol' smile on my face. I don't have the ability to smile physically, so just, like, y use your imagination. I can't think of any other game I have ever played that maybe run the emotional gambit quite as much as Subnautica did, at least not at all recently. One minute, I was swimming about the brightly colored and enchanting underwater wonder that was 4546B, getting invested and intrigued by all the wildlife, stories, and mysteries I was slowly unfolding. And then the next, I was feeling trapped in a titanium and plasteel lined coffin, slowly sinking itself deeper and deeper into a cold, unfeeling abyss of water pressure and nightmarish nothingness that threatened to swallow what little remained of my sanity. And what was that noise? So yeah, it left more than a bit of an impression on me, and naturally, I was eager to play Subnautica Below Zero when it was finally announced. Enough so that I actually did play some of it while it was still in the last few phases of its early access, and my initial first impressions were actually pretty strong. And then the game came out, and I played through it. And they weren't as strong after that. Now, I'm not saying I hated Below Zero, heck, I don't even really dislike it, but compared to the first game, I can't say I wasn't extremely disappointed by it. I enjoyed my time with it well enough, but throughout the entire playthrough, I kept feeling this creeping sense of disinterest slowly setting in, including one really big disappointment that almost made me abandon ship midway. But in the moment, I couldn't really entirely place my finger on why the game was failing to grab me in the same way the first one did. It couldn't have just been the familiarity factor. Well, upon a second playthrough, on my own time, I figured out a lot more reasons as to why, for me at least, Below Zero not only didn't entirely measure up to its predecessor, but may have missed the mark on several subtleties and nuances that the first game had done such a good job on. Now, I should say from the outset, this is not going to be ye old funny YouTube, argh, this game sucks, I'm a rant about it for 20 to 40 minutes video, but it is still going to be a very critical look at a game I wish I enjoyed significantly more than I did, and elaborating on the reasons why I feel I can't. With a new Subnautica game confirmed to be in development, I think now is as good a time as any to start thinking on some real, constructive feedback to hopefully make the future of the series as good as possible. If there's even the slightest chance that devs will hear me, and I doubt they will, but one can dream. For this purpose, I'll be borrowing the structure of my original Subnautica retrospective and applying it here, splitting my thoughts on the game up into the world, the Leviathans, and the story. I'll also likely be mentioning some offhand things that don't really fit into any of those categories, so just think of that structure as more of a loose guideline. But with that all said, let's take a dive back into Below Zero and see where it might have gone wrong. One of the greatest strengths of Subnautica, and the one thing about it I literally cannot shut up about, was its world and its atmosphere. The visuals and design of its environments created such a unique feeling of wonder as you explored it, which gradually gave way to a sense of slow, creeping terror the deeper that exploration took you. Bright and vibrant colors slowly melted away into something more dark and unsettling, and it led to a growing paranoia of what that murkiness in the distance could possibly be hiding from you. Nearly three years later, and that still makes me nervous. And now's when I'm supposed to say something like, but below zero, and yada yada yada, but here's the thing. My feelings on this are more complicated than this just being a simple downgrade. The world isn't bad, it's just... I'll try to explain. Below Zero's environments tried to have more complexity and varied designs, with a lot more color, curve, and structures than the more wide open and, at least conceptually, simpler areas that Subnautica had. On paper, this should have made me like Below Zero's world more, since I'm one of those people who saw the brown and gray filter trend of the modern military shooter era as one of the worst times for video game art direction in history. So, more color and more complexity is usually a yes please for me. And in a different kind of game, it still would have been. But there's the key phrase right there. In a different kind of game. Heads up, you're probably going to hear that more than once. 
This is not to say that Below Zero's world looks bad or anything. It legitimately does not. There's clearly a lot of effort in the art design on display here, and it would be irresponsible of me to just say it sucked moving on. The issue, however, at least the one that I kept feeling, was I wanted to get lost and mystified in these locales in the same way that I had in Subnautica, but I just couldn't. There was this lingering sense of disassociation and frustration that kept pulling me out of the environment just enough that I couldn't get fully immersed, no matter how much I tried. It took me a second and a half playthrough to fully nail down what it was I was feeling, and I think I finally got it. I think Below Zero missed a few very crucial subtleties from its predecessor. At its core, Subnautica was a game of slow exploration and immersion, making you feel progressively more and more isolated and unsettled the deeper you went, and the gameplay, visual design, and sound design all worked together to create this escalating feeling of unease that is so integral to the game's entire experience. Areas were generally bigger and more wide open, which allowed the player to better take in their surroundings and had a bit more of that wow factor to them. On top of showing more of that distant murkiness in some areas, which is perfect for hiding anything that may have been watching you. In Below Zero, the areas are certainly impressive looking, but at least to me, a lot of them felt more closed in, with more small passages, structures, and a lot more varied color, but to the point of it being a bit distracting, Maybe this was an experience that was unique to me. Maybe my brain is just weirdly wired, and I'll readily admit that your mileage may vary, but I couldn't shake this distracting feeling of annoyance when traversing some of these areas. What I also really didn't like is how a lot of Below Zero's more interesting areas are of the go here once, get thing at end, then leave and never come back kind, evoking feelings of a Legend of Zelda dungeon rather than feeling like steps in a continuous journey. Yes, in Subnautica, there were places you typically only went to once, like the Aurora, the Purple Mushroom Caves, or the Primary Containment Facility, but you usually spent a lot of time there first, and even the smaller structures you visited had vital information, technology fragments, or interesting notes to find. The complexity in visuals was also a lot of effort that I feel was unnecessary. A lot of Subnautica's locales were conceptually simpler in terms of color, overall design, and structure, but that simplicity allowed for a much pardon the pun, deeper and expansive feeling world. Less is more in certain cases, and when you're trying to make an underwater world feel huge, that's certainly one of those cases where it applies. In a different kind of game, I would love all these more complex and interesting designs, and the more go here, do this, then leave objective list style of world layout would be fine. But beauty in simplicity, immersion, and exploration were Subnautica's strengths, and Deviating too far from that while still keeping its general gameplay felt disjointed to me, like something wasn't right. I think one of the biggest problems in the immersion breaking though was the sound design. Below Zero is too loud, literally and visually. Too many creatures make distinct noises that stand out and draw attention. Too many environmental effects go off and make their own noises. Your vehicles all make much more constant sounds that don't stop, even when standing completely still. All this extra noise takes away from that very strong atmosphere and ironically made it harder for me to focus on things when so many sounds are distinct and vying for your attention. I think the absolute biggest offenders are the squid sharks and the cryptosuchuses. I think I'm saying that right. These two creatures make noises on par with nearby leviathans, and they're fairly numerous in comparison. They flat out got annoying as I went back and forth throughout my journey, and while they weren't the only examples of creatures with way too loud and distinct noises, they were the worst in my opinion. Though honorable mention to the snow stalkers making this weird noise constantly. 
Subnautica overall was a pretty quiet game. Even the sounds of its vehicles were generally subdued and easily tuned out, usually going completely silent if you sat still, lending more power to those moments where you swore you just heard something. And you stop, slowly scanning the watery abyss around you trying to find it. Distinct and louder sounds were rare, and more often than not, were associated with immediate danger. This made them stand out more, and so anytime you heard a sudden noise that vaguely sounded like a reaper roar off in the distance, it immediately pinged that fight or flight center of the brain. Or at least it would for me anyway. Hello. Also, as a quick aside, since we mentioned them earlier, I really miss the sea moth and the cyclops. I get why a lot of people prefer the convenience and modularity of the sea truck and how it basically combined the two vehicles into one, but I really didn't care for it all that much. It wasn't bad, and like I said, I get the appeal, but to me, it's an example of making things a bit too convenient, and it didn't carry the same weight. I liked how each of my vehicles in the previous game had different but very useful purposes. The sea moth was for speed, maneuverability, and higher level depth exploration. The prawn suit was for slobber knocking the first thing with fangs that looked at you wrong. And while the cyclops was cumbersome and took a bit to get the hang of, it made those dives into deeper areas feel like way bigger deals as a result. And come on, the first time you got the cyclops felt like such a major accomplishment, and the sea truck just doesn't hold a candle to that in the slightest. Plus, does the sea truck speak to you in the sexiest AI voice possible? Welcome aboard, Captain. All systems online. I didn't think so. What about the snow fox, you may ask? I think the music is also a point worth talking about, especially considering I didn't bring it up once in my original retrospective on Subnautica, which is just a fucking crime I need to correct. The soundtrack for Subnautica was just mwah, perfect, superb. Maybe that's because I associate good memories with the tracks, but I don't know, man. The opening theme alone carries this feeling of mystery and wonder just waiting beneath the waves. Below Zero's got a pretty dang good menu theme too. It's very different, but it's still very good. And that's the best way I can describe how I feel about Below Zero's music in general different, but very good. It goes for a different kind of feel, with more beats and techie sounding elements that are a lot more distinct individually than its predecessor. It creates some really nice sounding tracks, but I can't deny, in context, I don't think they're as strong. Subnautica 1's soundtrack was conceptually simpler, noticing a pattern yet, with more droning noises and subdued beats, but there's a hidden complexity to that type of music when it's done well that I think most people don't appreciate. The way it can just melt into the background and enhance the visual atmosphere rather than acting independently of it. It isn't concerned with sounding great on a CD, it's concerned with emphasizing the specific mood that the area you're in is trying to create. The strongest, in my opinion, was the track Lava Castle, for when you enter the lava caves and the blood kelp forests. Why that music sting? That sting with the slight bell and thunder-like noises in the background catches your attention, followed up by sounds of water being filtered. What sounds like slowed down chimes bounces from ear to ear, adding just a bit more variety to the initial sounds. Then, the droning gets louder. And the thump, thump, thumping of the percussion mimics a heartbeat in your ears as you slowly descend, all while the drones gradually become more menacing.
It's distinct enough and subdued enough that it blends into the background without becoming lost in it. Despite it not being particularly catchy, it's been stuck in my mind for years. It's such a good track and is my go-to during streams for any tense atmospheric music goes here moments. I recognize that Below Zero was trying to do something different, but I guess the nostalgic boy in me just wanted to get all spooked underwater again. Still, I can't say it didn't try to do that, it just didn't do it as well. Between the louder sounds and distinct entities, it feels like the game is trying to pull my attention in too many directions at once. Now, that could just be me and, you know, ADHD brain go brr, but that's one of the strongest feelings I got from the game personally, and it was constant. I wanted to get lost in these environments, but the game wouldn't let me. Which just frustrates me more when I see how much effort was clearly put into the visuals and how much the devs really wanted to expand on and add on to the general Subnautica experience overall. I need to reiterate, this isn't a bad game. It's a good game, but in my experience, there's just too many small things wrong with its world and sound design that add up over the course of a whole playthrough. And even the little things, if they're a constant annoyance enough, can ruin an experience in the long run. But this is all just one aspect of said experience. What about the rest? The Leviathans were integral to OG Subnautica. Without them and the danger they posed, the game wouldn't have had nearly the same impact as it did, and it wouldn't have become one of my all-time favorites. While the Leviathans were somewhat rare encounters, becoming aware of their existence suddenly made diving into those deeper, unknowable areas feel much more risky, and being alone out in the quiet, dark waters got a lot more tense with that constant underlying fear of seeing something huge suddenly appear from the darkness. The fucking amazing sound design is partly to thank for that as well. Engine powering down. Okay, this thing should be fine to leave here. So how about Below Zero's Leviathans? They certainly exist. Okay, in all seriousness, I don't want to be completely negative on Below Zero, and this pattern of just going, but this game's insert thing here isn't as strong over and over, is already getting repetitive and is driving me crazy. So I'm actually gonna focus on the positives of the Leviathans first. I love their designs, across the board. While I do think the original three are more iconic, these ones are more impressively put together, and I would be an idiot to not draw attention to that. The theme this time around seems much less underwater monster and more giant aquatic predator, as each one has a much more distinctly animal look to them. I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for to describe them is, but basically I could see actual real life creatures looking a lot like these things, especially on a planet that's almost completely aquatic like this. In fact, I'm fairly sure the ice worm was actually based off of the bobbit worm, but uh, we'll, we'll get to the ice worm in a second. I don't want to go ape just yet. Of the three leviathans, the most prominent one is the chelicerate. Chelicerate? I'm not sure. You'll likely encounter them fairly frequently as they're positioned nearby several objectives and honestly, I like them a lot. I'd say they don't have the same fear factor as the Reapers per se, but at the same time, that is not at all a fair comparison. The Reaper is a special case for me personally because of the way I was introduced to it and that's not gonna be easily matched by anything. And while I don't think the Chelly is as scary, that screech it does when it's charging at you was pretty damn spine tingling the first few times I heard it. I have vivid memories of playing this game off camera a while ago, falling into a ravine in my prawn suit, and then hearing this thing screaming toward me off screen somewhere above me, and I just reflexively closed my eyes and braced myself. Though I found myself becoming used to this thing much quicker than any of the previous ones, and well, getting a perimeter zappy defense system very early in the game, which makes them fuck off immediately definitely didn't help. I think it speaks volumes that despite how familiar with the original game I've become, the distant sounds of both the Reaper and the Sea Dragon still make me tense up as I approach them. It's right fucking outside, I know it is. And actually, on that subject, what happened to the distant roars? Best I can tell, they're just gone. They were such an important part to the original Subnautica sound design despite how infrequent they were, and made approaching any area instantly more tense the second you heard anything that sounded even slightly like them. Or maybe there were distant roars for the Leviathans in Below Zero and they just kinda got lost in all the other sound going on around me. 
There's only one exception I could think of, but it wasn't exactly like it, and again, I'll get to it. I guess this could just be nostalgia and wanting to have the same experience again, but I can't lie, man. If those noises existed for these other Leviathans, their encounters would feel like much bigger deals. With that said, though, I will definitely admit, the Shadow Leviathan was a good shock to the system. Oh! What the fuck? After going through much of the game slowly becoming disinterested, diving into the crystal caves and suddenly playing a game of deadly hide-and-seek with a huge centipede-ish thing was a good wake-up call. It was the only time in the entire game I felt like prey timidly hiding away from a predator that I could only fight off temporarily. And since this wasn't a place I could leave easily, like whenever I would run across a Chelly in the wild and I would just need to give them a face full of lightning and then drive away, I had to hide and keep my wits about me as best I could so I didn't get myself eaten. Again. And as a personal anecdote, my encounter with the Shadow Leviathan was basically an entire arc that hit a climax right around here. Oh. oh. We can come back to this. I just lost my prawn suit. Suddenly robbed of my titanium-lined mech suit, I was not only immensely vulnerable now, but I was stuck with no easy access to air as I was trapped 1100 meters underwater with two Shadow Leviathans patrolling the area around me. So I decided that if I was gonna die, I wasn't going back empty-handed. Uh... Ouch! You know what? Fuck it. If I'm gonna die, I'm not going back empty-handed. Come back here, bitch. Hold still, you wiggly son of a fuck. Get back here. I'm not leaving empty-handed. I am getting your PDA entry, you bitch. Come here. You will share your knowledge with me, creature of the deep. Ah, got it. All right, fuck you. I don't know how I'm not dead yet, but I'm probably going to die here eventually. Or you'll just leave me be. Okay, that's, that's, nope, never mind. Here he comes again. Whee! Hello! <laughs> Goodbye! <laughs> Let's see how far I can make it. Probably not very. Afterwards, I managed to just barely make it back to an air pocket in time before retreating back to my sea truck. And as I boarded it, I felt intensely worn out after that whole ordeal. Stressful, yes, but that was the first time I felt really invested in my entire playthrough. Well, second time, technically. Gather round, friends. It's story time. Welcome, dear viewers, once again to story time with Sethorvan. Once upon a time, a little game known as Subnautica Below Zero was still in early access. Sethorvan, having grown immensely fond of the previous game, got a bit impatient waiting for it to be finished and decided to stream a few sessions of it pre-release. His first few moments with the game were fine enough, but eventually his journey took him to the giant glacier, upon which he discovered many new items and technologies, such as the Snow Fox, and was eager to try them out. After building his new vehicle and gaining access to the second half of the glacier, however, he heard a noise. And little did he know the mayhem that was to follow. The Ice Worm was a fantastic part of my early access experience. Traveling across a glacier with a speedy new gravity bike and being repeatedly attacked by a burrowing monstrosity with a 1000 degree knife for a face was tense. The Ice Worm felt like it could come from anywhere and attack with such ferocity and frequency that I barely had any time to catch my breath. The only moments of downtime I had were retreating into caves and smaller areas, but they were mere pockets of safety that I would have to leave behind eventually. More than once, I felt a sense of what I can only describe as excited dread as I sped through narrow passageways hearing this thing tunneling loudly through the ice hot on my heels. And several times I could only watch in horror as a wave of debris and ice came rushing toward me at top speed. Oh god! Oh god! Oh! Holy shit! It is huge! Holy fuck! 
Oh, God! Getting launched around by the Ice Worm's attacks was simultaneously stressful as I watched my Snow Fox's health with ever-increasing wariness, but also kind of... fun, in a way? The entire encounter was a fast-paced chase scene that took place across the entirety of the glacier, and every moment I was out of those safe spots, I was getting attacked. Yeah, the game had items and a mod for the Snow Fox that made the Ice Worm's attacks less frequent, but I didn't want to do that. Getting chased by this thing was fun, and while it was the furthest possible thing away from the slow, gradual build of atmospheric terror that I loved about Subnautica, this was more than a welcome alternative and was, in my opinion anyway, a really good example of Below Zero doing its own thing and doing it well. The Ice Worm attack was such a good part of the early access for me that throughout my playthrough of its full release, I kept thinking to myself, oh, I can't wait to get to the Ice Worm. I know exactly how I'm gonna edit it together. I know what music I'm gonna use and ah, it's gonna be so awesome. Let me ask you something. You ever been so utterly, completely, devastatingly disappointed that you just can't process it at first? How about live on stream, when the crux of people's enjoyment of watching you hinged on making the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay as engaging and fun as possible, feeling obligated to show some level of enthusiasm and interest, despite your inner voice telling you in the loudest possible way, this isn't right, this sucks, this isn't supposed to suck, what happened? What did they do? Because that's what happened to me. I don't think I have ever been let down by a game so hard in my life. What used to be my absolute favorite part of the game was turned into a buggy mess and a vastly neutered experience compared to its previous version. Not only did the Ice Worm's attacks become much, much less frequent, which was the exact opposite of what I wanted, my game bugged out something horrible in my playthrough, and the Ice Worm's hitboxes became, to put it as politely as possible, fucked beyond repair. No, you're not seeing this wrong. This is actually happening. The Ice Worm's attacks are hitting me from halfway across the fucking planet in a show of hitbox jank that would make even old school Monster Hunter players raise a few eyebrows. Plesioth's cross-country hip checks have got nothing on this. I mean, this is just fucking excusable I need to reiterate to you all, I fucking love Subnautica. I made a 40 minute video goddamn gushing about the game, and I wanted, legitimately, really wanted, to like Below Zero even half as much. But when this happened, I almost quit. I really wanted to. Even during the second playthrough where its hitboxes seemed to be behaving normally, the encounter was still not even a fraction of what it used to be. The less frequent attacks of the Ice Worm took a sledgehammer to any sense of tension the moment could have, but that and the bugs wasn't the worst part. I'm sure you've noticed something else happening by now. No, I'm not accidentally hitting a key and hopping off my Snow Fox in surprise. Every attack from the Ice Worm is knocking me off of it. Every. Single. One. It would have been one thing for the Ice Worm's attacks to have been made less frequent, but this removed the entire chase aspect of the whole encounter. No, I don't care if it's more realistic to get knocked off of it. This made something that was fun, unfun. So it was a bad change. Hey, I guess now's a good time to talk about the Snow Fox. It's a buggy mess of a vehicle that isn't even that fast, can only be used on land, and even then its only real use is traversing the glacier, and it has a nasty habit of fusing itself with the map's geometry at times. Wow. It's made of paper, requires an entirely different docking station to be built just to make it, a docking station that is not used for anything else, mind you, aside from naming and coloring the thing, and with the addition of it being covered in grease every time the ice worm appears, it was made literally useless. Snow Fox? More like... Stupid. It was so bad that in my original playthrough, I elected to just take the prawn suit onto the glacier instead, which ended up working a lot better, enough so that... It was apparently the main way people did that section in the full release. Now, since then, it seems they've upped the damage it does, so that's no longer an easy thing to do, but it doesn't matter. The main thing I loved about the original encounter is still entirely gone. Not bugged, not broken, gone. Removed. Patched out. Maybe there's something in the game that makes the Snow Fox stop ejecting you every time the Ice Worm attacks, but I honestly don't care at this point, because it didn't need to do that in the first place. It was good before! Why did they change it? 
You know, here was me at the beginning saying this wasn't gonna be a rant video, and it largely isn't, but this one part is the exception. This actually pissed me off. Unknown Worlds, I love you. You made one of my absolute favorite games, and I know you can do good. There are parts of this game I really like, but please take this as a learning opportunity. I don't want to be this angry, but I gotta be 100% honest about my thoughts with this. Otherwise, there's no point in me talking about it. So while I still love the looks, animations, and sound design of the Ice Worm, it's a frail, withered shell of its former self, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. So let's move on, shall we? I think I've talked your collective ears off enough. Rather than only discuss Below Zero's overall story, I feel it's important to talk about all the narrative aspects of the game and how they all individually measure up. It's complicated. Robin, our main character, is basically smuggled onto 4546B in the most literal crash and burn method possible, with the goal of finding out what happened to her sister, Sam. Sam was part of a research team working for Altera that had been sent to 4546B after it began recovering from the Kara bacterium, and apparently perished planet-side some time prior. The stated reason from Altera is negligence on Sam's part, which Robin doesn't buy for a second, and really who could blame her, and elects to go searching herself. This is when things get kind of complicated though, since there's something else I need to mention before we go any further. Below Zero was completely rewritten during its early access, though its original story still shared some plot beats with the current version. I imagine this might have caused some problems internally as the world was seemingly already designed with the previous story in mind. Unfortunately, I didn't get much experience with the old one, but here's what I do know at least. Robin was still the player character, though she sounded much different, and Sam was actually still alive. She was something of a helper character, communicating with Robin frequently as she explored the world. And like the current version of the story, things start to kick off when Robin discovers an ancient precursor structure hidden within the Twisty Bridges. Sounds like a distress call. As she explores inside, Robin comes into contact with a massive alien Rubik's Cube, with some strange voice speaking to her asking for help, as whoever this is seems to be trapped within. When Robin tries to offer her PDA for the cube to beam its consciousness into, however, things don't go quite as expected. Brace from Chastel. Brace? As an aside, I do personally think new Robin's reaction to this is more fitting than old Robin. You're in my head. I am also surprised. Is it reversible? I hope so. With the processing power available, it may take some time. I will alert you when I exit hibernation. This is exactly why we have protocols. You are in my head? I offered you my PDA. Get out! Oh, no. Does your kind perceive a boundary between cybernetic and organic components? My mind is not a component. This is the biggest plot element of Below Zero. Robin sharing a brain with the only known surviving member of the Precursors, now referred to as the Architects, Al Ann. My whole life I've been dying to meet a sapient, space-fearing alien up close, and you're telling me your name is Alan? Is it insufficient? Straight up. Alan is the best character in the game. They have a kind of inquisitiveness and very literal personality that is incredibly endearing. Their voice is wonderful and is exactly what I'd imagine someone from a species of sentient data inhabiting biological forms would sound like. It is both reassuring and unsettling to rediscover this site after being in storage for so long. They seem to have also inherited some of that dry, unintended sarcasm from the previous game's PDA. You have such a way with words. Is that... Sarcasm. It was. You're learning. Hopefully, I will not have time to complete my study. Well, mostly unintended. They're also my personal favorite because they're the strongest aspect of mystery and intrigue this story has. We already know about the Kara Bacterium and what 4546B's whole vibe is, that being underwater nightmare world, but we've never directly interacted with a living architect before, and honestly, 
Some of the exchanges between Robin and Alan are my favorite bits of dialogue in the entire game. It's the whole sci-fi concept of the individual mind meets the collective consciousness mind. But what I appreciate is that the game doesn't say one is better than the other overall. Sure, both Robin and Alan butt heads about what they both value, Alan using the word inefficient with particular frequency, but over time their conversations become more about understanding each other's unique perspectives on existence, and what it means to be yourself in their respective metaphorical worlds. My absolute favorite line from Alan is this one, where they try to describe what it's like being separated from their people's collective. Imagine a thousand strings, each playing its own range of notes, none louder than the others. Each one builds harmony, a continuous thrum in the background of existence. I am now a lone string in search of familiar harmonies. I'll help you find them. I do like how Robin seems to immediately pick up what Alan is saying. Alan is of a people whose entire existence is shared, every thought and memory co-experienced. They can act with autonomy, but they frequently use this innate connection with each other to better cooperate toward common goals with greater efficiency, and to understand one another's feelings on a deeper, personal level to better communicate. Alan being cut off from their collective is not only like being robbed of a purpose, but also having a piece of yourself ripped out of you. A sense of comfort and belonging that's now suddenly voided and empty. You could say it's like a feeling of crushing loneliness, which we're already pretty familiar with, aren't we? In contrast, Robin explains how in human existence, we value our autonomy and privacy. And while our lives may be short and altogether without true purpose and meaning, it's the meaning we give ourselves that ultimately drives us on a foundational level. The relationships we form with one another enrich and change us and our perception of the world, as we're each vastly different from one another. We pass on knowledge to the next generation, hoping to make their existence just that little bit better. They're concepts that Alan at first finds inefficient, but eventually, as the story progresses, Alan seems to turn to Robin for emotional guidance in one particular exchange, as they discuss how humankind keeps persisting in their individual lives. You are expressing optimism, but it is not supported by probability. Hope isn't based on statistics. It's born from a drive for something better. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. I promise we'll get answers one way or another, Alan. Adding hope to your database. I fucking love Alan's response to this so much. From the wording to the very literal interpretation of Hope being a sturdy, winged avian creature, it's kind of adorable, but Alan seeming resolute to find this Hope bird says that they asked this question not because they were just curious, but because they didn't have any hope of their own in that moment, and maybe seeing Robin persisting in her struggles despite also being lost and alone was inspirational in a way. I'm focusing so hard on this aspect of the story, both because I legitimately find it very engaging and very fun to write about, and also to kind of balance out the explosion of cynicism and anger I just had to keep this video from capsizing completely. And also because, sadly, it's the only part of the story I really enjoyed. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, Below Zero's narrative is messy. Even more so the second time around as I was focused on all the dialogue and actually trying to be engaged more than I was before. The cast of characters in Below Zero can certainly be described as... colorful. I already gushed about Alan, my love, but everyone else ranges from pretty good to... kinda not. I didn't really have any problems with Robin, honestly, though she can be way too talkative and noisy at times, adding on to that sound overdesign problem I mentioned earlier, and Sam was pretty alright overall for the moments she was a part of, but everyone else is... Mm hmm. Maybe you were asleep or busy doodling inappropriate sea creatures. Those drawings are art. I appreciate that Below Zero was trying to have a more... light-hearted approach to its dialogue for the most part, and to the game as a whole, but I'ma be honest, some of this was not the way to do it. This just sounds awkward and forced. Oh, my family has many different brains. Like a... A Hydra? Uh, well... I don't know anyone who actually talks like this, and I don't want to. 
Though I'll admit, Fred's simple everyman attitude and aversion to swearing was pretty endearing. Cheese on a cracker. Ugh, I just want to drive around and deliver cargo in peace. But some exchanges between these characters were either painful to me or worse, just incredibly boring. What certainly didn't help is that, at least in my playthroughs, it felt like these mundane conversations made up most of the voice PDAs I found throughout the game. Don't get me wrong, I have no problems at all when a story has its characters not talk about the plot and just have moments to converse, getting opportunities to be more fleshed out as people and such, but when it's the vast majority of spoken narrative you find, it tends to become a problem. Of all the voice PDAs I picked up, I barely remember any that were either interesting, informative, or even funny most of the time. Most of the attempts at humor, which a lot of the conversations consist of, fall so flat they could star in this game. It got to the point where I was just so disinterested that I mentally checked the fuck out of the game's narrative when it wasn't about Alan and the Architects. Not that all of it was bad, though. There were still some bits I liked. I want to draw a special attention to Emmanuel here, the leader of the Frost Pack team of researchers Sam was a part of. Every exchange with him was seeping with that special kind of faux enthusiastic manager energy that we've all dealt with at some point in our lives. Fred, great to see you. Come on in. You don't mind if I record this, do you? Uh, am I in trouble? <laughs> no. You know me. Just a fanatic for details. Good morning, Frost Pack. Just a quick update to inform you of some key achievements and priority shifts we need you all to get behind. Please join me in congratulating Samantha IU, who is now reassigned to Outpost Zero, helping us dream of future initiatives. Congratulations are also in order for Danielle Valenti and her team at Omega Lab. The closing of Phi Robotics means important funds can be redirected to their Kara bacteria study, which has important positive implications for the life sciences. It is actually very hard to make a voice that is almost immediately hateable without sounding entirely cartoonish or fake. I can absolutely see Manu here telling me in the most creepily nice way possible to be a team player when he asks me to come into work on my next five weekends. Kudos to the voice actor for that role. You did good. And on the subject of characters I actually like, there's one more I have some high praises for. In fact, she's my second favorite character in the game, just behind Alan. She single-handedly rescued some of the story for me, and the only real complaint about her I have is that more isn't done with her. I'm of course talking about... I told you to stay off my land. Marguerite Maida, the rogue mercenary whom you may remember as being the higher bodyguard of the Degasi crew in the last game. Her presence here is definitely confusing and raises some plot problems I'll get to later, but she's still a great character overall for the short time we see her. We already got familiar with her personality from the Degasi logs before, now we get to see the Merc herself in the face, and yeah, if you told me this lady knew about 20 different ways to kill me with her bare hands, I would believe you. Yes, that is a Reaper skull on her wall, by the way. Her introduction is ambushing you with a prawn suit modified to wield a chelicerate mandible as a fucking sword, which is just awesome in general, but immediately gives you the vibe they were going for with this lady. Function over form, survivalist, brutal, and efficient. But not unpleasant. I say she rescued some of the story for me because, miraculously, her voice PDAs are actually interesting to listen to, and genuinely had me wanting more than what we got. Hearing her describe how she survived living inside the floating carcass of a Reaper Leviathan, finding a home in the Arctic of 4546B, learning how to manage and grow her own food for all the nagging nutritional needs they provide, and hearing her relationship with Sam as they both plan to stop Altera's efforts in weaponizing the Kara bacterium, were all genuinely nice to listen to. You think so? Come on! Is a bacteria a threat, or isn't it? It is. Does it need to be dealt with or not? It does. So who's right on this? I am. Say it like you mean it. I am. I said like you mean it, not like you're testifying before a rigged transgov court. I am. Right. In fact, Unknown Worlds, if you're looking for more to do with this universe, I wouldn't be opposed to a side game where we play as Meta covertly undermining Altera's efforts on some other backwater world. Just saying. It'd probably have to be an action stealth game or something though, as that'd just fit her better, but still, potential there. 
I can't say she completely fixes everything, sadly, because, well, not only would she not be able to, despite how awesome she is, but best I can tell, following you meeting her again in the greenhouse, she's never brought up again and just kind of stops existing in the story. I'll be entirely honest, by the time I got close to the game's ending, I had no desire to go looking for story bits, so maybe I missed some more that's done with her. Feel free to let me know if that's the case. Also, I did mention that she kinda poses some plot problems. <clears throat> well, I can think of two big ones right away. First of all, how has she survived this long? Ignoring the fact that she apparently floated all the way to the fucking Arctic, how the hell did the Kara bacterium not kill her? The Degasi crashed on 4546B 10 years before the Aurora did, and Below Zero takes place another two years after. It's been 12 years, and for 10 of those, Kara was basically incurable. And the time from infection to death is apparently not that long according to the Degasi logs. Also, did I mention she floated all the way to the fucking Arctic? Look, I get it, 12 years is a long time, but I don't think any carcass, no matter how buoyant, is gonna be able to float from here all the way to here! That's halfway across the fucking planet! I'm sorry, but no matter how badass you are, the laws of time and space still apply to you, usually. So as much as I love Meta, if more wasn't going to be done with her, she really shouldn't have been in the game because she just doesn't do enough to justify the fucking ocean liner sized plot holes her presence makes. Still awesome, just fucking baffling. This all assumes nothing else is done with her after the greenhouse though, so if I'm wrong about that, feel free to disregard everything I said. I would have checked myself, but writing and voicing that part was way too fun to leave out, so I'm just gonna let myself look like an idiot if I'm wrong. Hell, that honestly would make it funnier. There's probably more I could go over, but honestly, there's only one last part of the story I want to touch on, and that's the ending, both to Sam's story and to the whole game. From the beginning of the game, Sam's death is set up as sketchy, as Robin doesn't believe she could ever be negligent enough to get herself killed, and honestly, Altera doesn't strike me as a reputable source. This is implied more as you listen to Sam's messages explaining that she stumbled across some troubling plans that Altera has for the samples of Kara found in the frozen body of a massive leviathan. I'm afraid something terrible is gonna happen. I don't know what to do. I guess I should just come out and say it at this point. I've said this much already. We found a frozen leviathan that's infected with Kara. Altera thinks they can use it for something. Weapons, experimental treatments, a whole range of things. But one end of the range is ugly, dangerous, but, but profitable, of course. I, I hope I'm overreacting, but I don't think I am. From other logs you find, it seems Altera caught wind of Sam's snooping, as many of her co-workers are encouraging her to drop it and not pursue further. She's relocated to Outpost Zero, which is basically the timeout corner for anybody in the research team deemed worthy of it, and she works with Meta to devise a way to destroy the bacterium for good. It seemed like the game was setting up Sam's death to be a cover for something much worse, and Altera was going to try to get their Kara weapon no matter what. On top of that, Alan confirmed that they had been hiding from Altera all this time, and felt anyone associated with them couldn't be trusted. So what's the big reveal? How did Sam die, and how does her story end? She died because of a cave-in, caused by an explosive she and Maida created to destroy a lab, and her story ends by Robin putting a vaccine she synthesized into a rolling machine that destroys the bacterium in the frozen body. That's pretty lame, guys. So for all that buildup, we get a very cop out -y feeling cause of death and a monologue from Robin about how happy she is she could finish her sister's work and find peace. Look, I'm not asking for the climax to have been Robin going commando on Altera agents sent to stop her, although that would have been pretty cool, but this ending is just fucking deflating. Any sense of intrigue or mystery in the Sam story leads to basically nowhere, and it ends by us putting a thing in a thing that stabs another thing. I was half hoping to return to the glacier and find the body gone or something, anything to make the final moments of the game feel more impactful. Meanwhile, Alan's story ends with us making them a cool looking robot centaur body and leaving the planet behind in an ending sequence that is really well animated and awesome to look at, barring some bizarrely out of place script notes left in the game's subtitles for some reason, which is still not fixed by the way. It's really apparent which parts of the story got the most care and attention paid to them and 
While I certainly understand focusing on Alan more, as, like I said, they're the best character in the game, why go through all that trouble just to half-ass it at the end? Games having lackluster endings is nothing new. I mean, hell, game endings being letdowns more often than not was the expected norm back in the day. But this game's actual ending doesn't suck, so what's the deal? Why is the Alan story seem so much more fleshed out and the Sam story feels so tacked on despite how important it is to our main character? Was the game supposed to have a different ending? Well, as it turns out, yeah, it was. In the old version. Even better, we have actual footage of it, albeit looking a bit like Alpha Minecraft. In the original story, as Robin and Alan are preparing to leave the planet, they're ambushed by an Altera gunship, only for Maida to come out of fucking nowhere in her prawn suit and, well, okay, the placeholder animation for her attacking the ship is fucking hilarious. But as she distracts them, Robin and Alan make their escape and portal away. Granted, though, this was the ending for the old story, the one where Sam is still alive, so maybe what we got was intended. Either way, one ending sucks, while the other is fantastic, so... Ugh. There's a reason I can't say I dislike Below Zero, even if it disappointed me, painfully so in one regard. Because I could see the makings of a good game in here, a really good one in fact. One that goes for a very different vibe from its predecessor, but like the old version of the Ice Worm, as long as they did the different stuff well, I would have liked it a whole lot more. But there's just too much about it that kept me from enjoying it as much as I really, really wanted to. Even when looking at it as its own experience separate from the first game, it still frustrates me. Because it feels like they sacrificed depth for breadth. Not enough is done with what they have, and they have too much. Too many things got packed into a game that was not big enough to take advantage of them properly. The very best and most succinct analogy I can think of when comparing the two games is to look at their box arts. Subnautica's art is conceptually simple, it's just a diver inspecting a reef with fish around him, but it's focused. It has good composition. It has color that stands out without going too wild, but still being immediately recognizable. It tells you that this game is about the intrigue, the exploration, the mystery, and water. A lot of water. Now, compare it to Below Zero's art. There's some nice designs and a lot of good looking color, but there's too much going on at once. You got Robin swimming away from a squid shark, you got a lot of purple and pink standing out from the blues and other dark colors, and you got the ice worm up there roaring over the glacier in the upper half. It's like they were afraid to leave any part of it empty. It's packed too full and has no focus. Which is the best way I can describe Below Zero, from my point of view. I know I've said it already, but I really gotta reiterate. This whole video is just me and my feelings on the game from my perspective. And you may feel very differently about it. You may think it's great, and that's cool. No problems if you do, because there's a lot about it that genuinely is. So why make this video at all, then? Because it starts a conversation. With the new Subnautica game on the horizon, now is as good a time as any to really get some discussion going, and come up with some genuinely thoughtful feedback. I didn't want this video to just be a rant, despite how angry I got at one point. I wanted to show my conflicting feelings on it and more thoroughly explain why I feel about it the way I do. Even if you really dislike this game, just saying it sucks and moving on says nothing and isn't going to help anybody. Giving actual thoughtful feedback is important, versus just giving a dismissive insult. Doing that can feel personally gratifying, but you're adding nothing to the conversation. And if you actually gave a damn about the series, you'd practice some critical fucking thinking. Yes, it's not our job to make the game good, but feedback matters. Feedback helps. But it's best given in a thoughtful way, which I hope I managed to do. I mean, yeah, the video was also supposed to be entertaining, so it was gonna exaggerate and goof around a bit, because that's just fun to do. But genuinely, I want to see the series do well wherever it goes next. So with that in mind, here's some brief suggestions I thought of. If you have any of your own, I'd certainly like to hear them in the comments. Just keep it civil. One less noise. Tone down the creature noises and visual clutter. Don't be afraid of letting players get lost in the open ocean. That's part of the experience. Two, bring back a silent protagonist. I don't mind Robin, but I will always highly prefer a silent protagonist in an atmospherically dense game like Subnautica. The other benefit of silent protagonists is you can have them be literally anyone or anything you want, and it doesn't change the game's experience, since it's the player who's projecting themselves into that role. Three, 
have a clear idea of what you want the game to be from the outset. Do you want it to be more of an atmospheric, quietly terrifying exploration experience like Subnautica? Or do you want it to be a more traditional narrative-driven experience? Or hell, something else entirely. Maybe you want to go full survival horror with the next one, I don't know. But in any case, have that firmly decided beforehand and try not to shift gears midway, unless there's a very good reason to. And four, seriously, tone down the attempts at humor. I love a good moment of comedic relief, but if this is what we can expect from a Subnautica game trying to have a more lighthearted tone, then I'd really rather we try something else. I'd rather listen to the crewmates of the Aurora slowly lose their minds panicking about being stranded on an alien world again, than listen to one more awkward office conversation from below zero. I can only take so much secondhand embarrassment. And that's about all I've got. There were a few other things I didn't mention, like the Mercury ship, but I don't think it's necessary to at this point. After all this, I'm pretty sure I got my point across. Below Zero, in the end, is not a bad game. It's a good game, hampered by some unnecessary choices and trying to do too much at once. And while I was very disappointed by it, I absolutely get why you may still like it. And with that, there's nothing else I can really think of to say, so I'm gonna end this in the only way I can think of. Sadly, a lot of my early access experience with the game has been lost to time, but I'm going to show you the only important clip from it that you need to see. Ah, no, 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 don't, 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 don't start flying away. Hey, come back, wait, no, come back! <laughs> wait a, wait a second, uh... <laughs> well, hope you enjoyed the video, everyone, and I genuinely hope you enjoyed Below Zero as well. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Twitch, and a very special thanks to my patron, Z. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and as always, y'all have a lovely evening, and I'll see you next time.